everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in tube lab number 201, woohoo! Wow, it's gonna <laughs> <laughs> actually, um, the flash sale we had after episode 200 it was uh, beyond our expectations. <laughs> it was absolutely insane. It took us till Wednesday afternoon to catch up. Um, anyways, thanks for. Uh, thanks to everyone who participated. It was a lot of fun. We gave we gave away huge discounts. Uh, <clears throat> people were allowed to double dip, which is not something we'll ever repeat again. In fact, it'll be uh, two years uh, before we hit episode 300. So, and maybe we'll do the same thing because it, it was a lot of fun, even if we did get back a lot of discounts. Yeah, <laughs> we did, but we got a lot of sales and thank you as always for supporting us. Okay, in today's episode, we're going to revisit the 6550C power tube. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, back in the 1950s, the 6V6 and the 6L6 were two of the common consumer power tubes in use, but there was a bit of a race on between tube manufacturers to get more power. There were a number of higher power transmitting tubes like the 6146, beam tetrode, and variations on the 6L6. They were acting like a stopgap to something new. Fast forward to 1954 and Tungsol released the 6550. Then in 1955, Philips introduced their EL34. And in 1956, GEC UK introduced the KT88. Three of the most popular power tubes ever invented, all released within a three year period. Today's focus is gonna be on the 6550 beam power tetrode. It was introduced by Tungsol as a higher powered 6L6 and since then has seen duty in many vintage and modern audio amplifiers. In particular, many vintage organs used it as a power tube. Eventually, many other companies made their own version of the 6550. Unfortunately, many of them turned out to be relatively short-lived power tubes, notably the GE 6550 has a reputation for losing vacuum early, and SED, the Svetlana Electronic Devices Company, made a version called the 6550B, which turned out to be totally unreliable and was withdrawn from the market. Today, you can still find those defective 6550Bs for sale at incredibly cheap prices. Don't be tempted. One company that purchased a large lot bragged that they thoroughly tested them and <laughs> what was their failure rate, Charles? Yeah, they claimed that 9 out of 10 were rejected as being defective or not good enough. <laughs> and for new old stock tubes, that is not a good number. No. And that brings us to the SED 6550C, the best 6550 ever made. In our opinion. <laughs> After the disaster with the 6550B, Svetlana got it right with the C version. And this is this often happens. GE really goofed up the 6SN7 and came bouncing back with uh, the GTA and later the GTB version, which are fantastic 6SN7. Like rock solid, reliable, and not at all like the first version. Yeah, I mean, when we get the early version, the GTs onto the tester, it's like, it's not even worth testing them. There's, they're just... Yeah, we won't even put them in the store. No. Yeah. So... Um, Svetlana not only created a reliable power tube, but a great sounding one as well. The biggest problem with power tubes after reliability is the sonics. And many beam powered tetrodes have a very flat mid range. The Svet 6550C solved that by introducing a version with a nice touch of warmth in the mids. The only problem with the Svet 6550C is that fakes and reissues are everywhere. It was such a popular power tube that modern production versions that share nothing but a superficial 
<laughs> I knew I wasn't going to say that word right. Nothing but a superficial similarity to the original are still being produced. And learning to spot these tubes could save you a lot of money and trouble. Let's take a look at a few of them and compare them to the real deal. Okay, so on the screen here we have two versions of the 6550C that are actually labeled as Svetlana. One of them is actually labeled Electroharmonix, and that's a big hint as to where these all three of these tubes were made. But these ones are not the originals. So let's take a look at this one first. This is the oldest version that we have here. We don't make a habit of buying these, obviously, but we do have some trickle in every now and then. So thankfully we do have some examples for you. And we can see we have a Svetlana Electronic Devices Inc. 6550C made in 1995. And the biggest tell on these right away is that we have these round holes in the plate. And now everybody on this channel is probably getting tired of us talking about this, but you want the square hole version for the original St. Petersburg. And otherwise, there's not that much spectacular, spectacular about this. They do look very similar to the original tubes, and we'll take a look at some of those in a little bit. Yeah, the side plate fold, if you stop on that and point it out. Yeah, this guy right that's here. That's very distinctive. Uh, SED in St. Petersburg never had that fold. Yeah, but somebody else did. And so let's take a look at the middle tube here. Here we have an Electroharmonix 6550EH. So EH is just the Electroharmonix version, and there's that same plate fold. Yeah, and Electroharmonix uh, is the brand name that uh, New Sensor out of New York uses uh, for tubes that are made in their uh, Saratov uh, Russia plant. Mm -hmm. And you can see we have almost the exact same plate structure here. Actually, I think the plate structure is the same, but they've added a couple of extra support rods on this version here. And obviously we have a slightly different bottle design on this 6550, but otherwise everything else is basically the same. And here we have the most modern version that we've been able to find, not intentionally, <laughs> of the new sensor produced 6550C. And this one amazingly was actually produced in 2023. And I don't know how this made it out of the country. Um, we definitely didn't try to find this, but it ended up coming in in a lot of tubes. And uh, yeah, so this is the 2023 version. And really the only major difference is that we have these extra fins added onto here, which is something that seems to be common in later production ones. It's also something common that you see on uh, Chinese produced versions of the KT-88 and 6550 probably to help with heat dissipation, although we don't know if there's any real reliability changes with these tubes. But they still have those round holes. That hasn't changed, and that is the big tip-off that these are not the original St. Petersburg production. Now, very early uh, Svetlana, true Svetlanas, did have a weird round hole, and that's on the, the, the B version that we talked about earlier. So we don't actually have one here, but we thought it would be important to print out a picture of one. I don't know if you can actually make out the holes. They're very distinctive. They've got a side getter. And no top getter, so they've got these clear domes on them. And this is how you spot a 6550B. If it has a clear dome and a side getter, run. <laughs> Stay away from it. Yeah, and the holes have a really kind of weird uh, layering effect. So if you, yeah, look, at the, here, if you look at the hole, it's hard to see in the picture, but when you look at it, you'll actually see that there's another hole below that hole. It's, yeah. it's very odd. It's but... sort of a nested structure on the inside, yeah. Yeah. So, well, how about we take a look at the real thing, Charles? Yeah, that'll be a bit nicer. Now, one of our highest demand tubes that we just can't keep in stock is the true vintage SED or Svetlana Electronic Devices St. Petersburg 6550C. And we recently got really lucky and we found a large large lot of of new old stock tubes of new old stock tubes new in the box that and hadn't been picked over hadn't been uh, put aside because they were noisy or microphonic now how did we know they weren't picked over because we ran them all through our power tube tester matcher we, we have a custom power tube tester mm -hmm. and it gives us um, a, an accurate picture at a normal oper high voltage operating point for this particular tube. So we, we had so many of them that we actually had them all out on our living room floor 
and Charles was sorting them out and he actually did a visual sort so we could see the uh, the distribution of testing numbers and it was really interesting you can actually see a full sort of a, a wave around the middle point where they're normally testing along with a few on the outskirts and uh, yeah they they tested beautifully they tested above what we would consider to be new old stock on average for these tubes across all of them do you want to show off one and show the yeah. the key key design points or build points so as you can see it looks very very similar to the other tube that we were looking at earlier the big distinctive difference of course are these square holes in the plate and it has that on both sides here look at this side um yeah, seam we don't, we don't have any of that sort of folded connection on either side so that's another big tell right there. Now there what there are some small variations of these original tubes. Um, sometimes you'll see them with black bases. That could just be because they've been run for quite some time and this mic and all base is darkened. So that would be a used uh, 6550. Yep. And a, an actual production variation are these getter rings that are up here. Sometimes they didn't angle them like this. So you can see how the gettering has flashed off on an angle, sort of a 45 degree angle on each side. Some of them were done just flat. So they were like this and you'd end up with sort of a flat chrome dome. Otherwise they are identical tubes. I'm not sure where that difference came from in production, but they, they made some of them. They do show up. And that's really common among manufacturers that do long production runs and mm -hmm. Svetlana tended to, uh, once they had a good tube, they would just keep making them forever and ever. Yep. Um, With very little change to them. Yeah. I mean, probably one of the biggest crimes in vintage tubes is that um, the SED company in St. Petersburg, and they're still around, um, decided that there just wasn't enough demand for uh, thermionic valves and in the modern age and just probably a year or two before uh, vintage tubes really made a resurgence, really made a resurgence they yeah. shut down their factory <laughs> <laughs> uh, what a shame it was a disaster for everybody but we have what do we have we have a lot of match quads and we were able to actually match up a number of quads with a match, close match spare. Yeah, we're always recommending it. So we uh, we put it into practice this time and we're, we're selling them with the match spare. Yeah, so there's actually uh, quite a, there's more quads available um, in the store, but there's, I think there's four quads that actually have the, um, uh, the match spare in the set. You'll see it listed like that. Yep, so you can buy them either way. And they all come with their original boxes, which are just in beautiful condition as well. Now, the only bad news is that they're expensive. Um, in fact, we paid the, the largest importation <laughs> fee we've ever paid uh, yeah. to bring them in. Yeah, the, the postal worker had this horrified, apologetic look on his face when he said, this is the biggest... Uh, customs fee we've ever seen <laughs> yeah and actually he didn't bring he didn't bring the box to yeah, us i think he assumed we were going to reject it <laughs> so anyways uh but that's all it's all related to the cost of of finding good quality tubes and uh in a minute i'm going to give you a hint as to how you can save a bit of money on what is really a very expensive purchase before we um take a look at the discount codes um let's I just wanted to mention that uh, we've got more content coming on our other channel, Melatone Kits. If you haven't subscribed and you're interested in uh, kit building and uh, uh, great sounding, reasonably affordable uh, tube gear. And seeing some of the background work that we put into putting them together for you, then uh, head on over to the other channel and subscribe and we'll be getting some more content up there for you. Yeah, and this, this week we're going to take a look at... Um, one of our earliest kit designs. This is the Erie Monoblock, and it's actually being retired, uh, which is uh, why we're going to revisit it one more time. It's not being retired because it sounded bad. Uh, it and just the opposite. It actually sounds absolutely amazing. Um, it just didn't sell that well. So, yeah. So pop on over there and uh, let's go take a look at the discounts. Okay. So here's a really good hint. Now. These tubes, particularly the four plus one, are really close to a secret code, a big secret code. And only two people in the history of, of the Cheers codes, um, which go right back to day one, uh, when, when I first started the business, 
Um, only two people have ever used this big code. So if you're if you're that close to that number, and I think people can figure that out pretty easily, um, just you know add a little preamp tube or whatever else you need um, to your order. And Bob's your uncle. You can use the biggest Cheers code available, and we and can. It gives you a hefty discount. Yeah, it gives you a hefty discount. We can reach uh, pretty much everyone around the world with $20 flat shipping. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping is on us. And if you are in a difficult to ship region, give us a shout before you order and we'll try and figure out if we can reach you or not. Um, island nations in particular, the Caribbean, the Philippines, um, a big a big chunk of Asia are really expensive to ship tracked. And when we're shipping expensive orders, we want to track it. <laughs> you want to track it. Trust us. Anyways, stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.